We're going to go to Revelation 11 this morning, but um, turn to Psalm 31, I think. Yeah. Turn to Psalm 31 just very quickly. I'll share with you uh, something. And uh, we'll, we're going to pretend something, okay? Psalm 31. Everybody there? All right. Look at verse 1. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never... Be ashamed, deliver me in thy righteousness. Uh, very quickly, sin is a shame and a reproach, the Bible says. It's like when Adam and Eve sinned, what is the first emotion they experienced? Shame. Immediately, they felt shame and they sought to cover up. And that's what we do. Uh, so when we ask God for salvation and put our trust in him, God takes our shame, our reproach away and delivers us in his righteousness for his righteousness sake. Verse two, bow down thine ear to me. This is us asking God to hear, a, to hear us when we pray to him. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily, be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. Verse 3, for thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake. And this is something, uh, I don't remember when I really first read this and when it occurred to me. But I can tell you that. If your heart is truly in the right place in that what you ask God for, you are asking for it so that his name is exalted. If you ask with that in your heart, and God knows the difference whether you fake it or not. Uh, if you ask for that with God's name sake in your heart and his kingdom first, this is what Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus was basically saying the same thing as, as David here. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. In other words, God, don't let me down the road where I'm going to drag your name through the mud and the dirt and cause reproach to be brought on your name. We know that if we ask your average lost person, generation X or whatever generation there is out there, ask them what their thoughts are concerning churches and preachers, positive or negative. What's their response going to be? Negative. Why? Because too many church people and too many preachers have taken the road of wickedness and taken God's name down that road. And while they claim to everybody to be super spiritual, super saved, uh, the, the, the devil just leaves them alone. The devil's actually afraid of me. Uh, the truth of it is uh, they get caught up in stuff. And it makes big headlines. It's all over Facebook, social media, people making videos on it. And all you're doing is dragging God's name through the mud. And if your heart is in a place where you truly can say, God, for your name's sake, for your honor's sake, for your kingdom's sake, do this. This is where my prayer is. If, if you work... If you work for Coca-Cola, and say you work in a Coca-Cola factory and you make Coca-Cola for a living, you don't wear Pepsi t-shirts to work. Amen? Huh? Not more than once. 
if you work for Anheuser-Busch up here, you don't wear old Milwaukee t-shirts to work. Okay, you don't do that. So that's, that's, a, that's a rude analogy, but that's basically what I'm getting at. Now verse 4 is where we're going to pretend something. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. Now we all know that Annette, uh, she's a real nice lady. Dun, dun, yeah. Pull me, the net is like a trap laid. Um, I don't know exactly how someone would hang a net to capture a tiger or a human or whatever. Um, how many humans have you caught, Brother George? One or two? Don't even ask him where they're buried. Don't ask. Um, but let's pretend something. Let, you've all heard of the internet. It's called the World Wide Web. And it, and, it, and it actually is like that. It is every strand connected to every other strand somehow, some way. In a spider's web or a net, every, every single strand uh, that's attached to that net is actually attached to every one of them, and so is the Internet. So when people first started using modems, that goes back to the 90s, to get on the internet, and then the, comp the phone companies and cable companies started getting high-speed internet for everybody, and now we have it on our phones, we have it everywhere we go, and every place that we can be, we are on the net. Or, or let me say it this way, let, let's pretend that God knew that in this time that we're living in, that most people in this world would have access to the internet. Let's pretend that God knew that. Okay? So think about that verse now, and let's just, let's just pretend that God, one of his meanings is, David, you asking God, pull me out of the net. Because if, the, the longer that we go, and live our lives attached to all these things that we have, the harder it's going to be. I mean, we've already seen what happens when a parent takes away a teenager's phone and their tablet and their laptop and their Xbox. We've already seen what happens when you do that to a teenager. In fact, it's not just teenagers now. It's four, five, six-year-old children. When you take that away from them, we see the effect that it has on them. The longer they go, the harder it is to give all of this up because we are acclimated to it. It's like getting in the pool. When you first get in the pool, you're freezing to death. Give it about five minutes, you'll be fine. And that's how we are now. So it'll get to a point, I think, where only God will be able to pull us out of the net, which they have laid privily for me. What, what if, what if somebody in the CIA or the NSA or one of its contractors thought up an idea back in the 1990s of how they could get more information, legally or illegally, from people in this world. What if they thought up how to use the internet to do such a thing? You know, some companies are backward-minded. When IBM, back in the, uh, IBM was dominant. Everybody knew what IBM was back in the 60s and 70s. They helped put men on the moon. And if you, were, you could tell a guy that worked for IBM, he wore a dark coat, dark pants, white shirt, dark tie. Everybody did, most, and most were men. 
But the CEO of IBM back in like 1979, 1980, something like that, was asked about the possibility of putting computers in people's homes. And he said, almost quote, I cannot see any reasonable use for the American family to have a computer in their home. Three years later, kaboom! The home computer market exploded. With the Apple, Commodore, I was a Commodore guy, Texas Instruments was making them, Atari was making them. All of a sudden now everybody's making computers. What if somebody back, I don't know, back in the 90s or no, figured out a way that they could privately sneak up on anybody they wanted to and learn anything they wanted to learn about them at any time. And I've told you this before, right now, you would be stunned at the information that has your name on it. And information right now is actually a commodity that is bought and sold and information about you. And I mean everything you do. And I'm, t I'm talking about if you raised your right hand this morning, that information was sent somewhere. And they want to know why you raised your right hand. And they'll find out. Okay, so look at this verse again. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about the, um, the addictions that come through the Internet. And it's not just dirty pictures either. How many people are hooked on Internet gambling? That's a big thing. That's a huge thing. Okay, um, or they are hooked on everybody's opinion of them and so they make little TikTok videos or they make little youtube videos and they make little facebook videos and they say i've got this problem going on in my life what do you think i should do about it and everybody chimes in and those people are basically hooked to what everybody in the world thinks of them and that's that's the net that has been laid for this generation and the succeeding generations. And so look at verse 5, though. Look at verse 5. See if you recognize it. Sound familiar? Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Jesus said that from the cross. Jesus said that from the cross. Did God deliver him? Eventually, three days later, Jesus, by example, was outwardly with his voice saying so that everybody could hear him. Y'all come on in and feel, make yourself at home, all right? Um, with his voice so that everybody could hear him at the hour of his death say, into thy hand I commend my spirit. And then he said, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. And God wants us to know that when it's at the worst that it can be, we can tell God, God, into your hand, I commit my spirit. Why? Because you trust him. You trust him. You're taking your most precious thing, that is your soul, your spirit, and you're giving it over to God and say, God, you take it. Because you're the only one that I can trust. I commit my soul, I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. But I just thought about that. I was reading that this morning, and I saw that word net, and I thought, I wonder if it's just possible, just possible. And then I, I answered the question about as soon as I asked it. Did God know that we were going to have this thing called an internet? A world wide web where everybody would be hooked on it. Duh. He wouldn't be much of a God if he didn't know that. He wouldn't be much of a God. All right, now, Revelation chapter 11. That was the warm up. Revelation 11. There was given me a reed. 
like unto a rod. And the angel stood, you know, I don't have this in my notes, but anyway. There was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. I've got these things underlined, and that's what we're going to talk about. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth, uh, you can get those at the men's warehouse, I think. Um, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, uh, I don't have this in my notes, but turn your Bible to uh, Ezekiel chapter 40, I, be I believe. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Um, there we go. Ezekiel chapter 40. Now, here's what I know. What I know is there is a connection between Revelation 11, uh, 1 and 2, where um, this angel gives John a rod... And it's a measuring rod. It's a, like a measuring stick, one that you would use uh, in construction uh, back before the days of tape measures. You know, they, yes, Ezekiel 40. Back before the days of tape measures, they had actual sticks that always played with them. You know, like that, broke one one time. But you undo them like that, and you've got measuring sticks. And, and this is what, do what? Masonry ruler? Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I knew that. I did. I just didn't want to make everybody sound stupid. Anyway, um, so he has, this, he has this measuring rod, and, and I know that there's a connection, like I said, between Revelation 11, 1 and 2, and Ezekiel 40, and the, the following chapters. I don't know what that connection is. I, I, I will be honest, and I'll, I'll not try to make up something to sound smart. I will tell you that there are some things that I've read and studied and prayed over and asked God about, um, and why they are, why did you put this in your word, why does this matter, um, and I don't always know. But anyway, in Ezekiel chapter 40, in the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth month, of the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year, after that the city was smitten, in the selfsame day the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. And the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass. Uh, who was this man, do you think? Or what was this man? Was it just a, a regular guy? It's an angel, I believe. I believe by his appearance. The, the brass generally is a symbol for fire. Okay? Uh, like the appearance of brass with a, fine, with a line of flax in his hand. And a measuring reed, just like John now has. And he stood in the gate. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I shall shew thee, for to the intent that I might shew them unto thee uh, art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. So the angel tells him, Son of man, I want you to watch now what I do. And I want you to, to set your heart on it. And I want you to remember it. 
And then I want you to, to declare it to everybody. I want you to write it down exactly the way I gave it to you. Then I, then I want you to put it in your book so that everybody can read it. So in, chat, in verse 5, Behold a wall on the outside of the house round about, and in the man's hand, this is what's interesting to me, was a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and in hand breadth. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed, and the height, one reed. What's so interesting about the size of this reed? Does anybody know? Take a wild guess. Maybe I'll give you a, a, a little bit of help. Say that again. Say it real loud. Okay? Something else in the Bible was six cubits. Goliath was this exact measurement, six cubits and a span of a man's hand. This is a span, and this is the cubit. Elbow to the tip of the finger, tip of the finger to the wrist is the span. So I've wondered why the, the measuring reed that this angel has it's the exact size, apparently. That's how, that's how it reads to me. Apparently, that's the exact size that Goliath was. I don't know. I don't have an answer for it. But it strikes me as being interesting. It's interesting to me because I don't know. Once I know, I'll just say, yeah, I knew that. Okay? So, if you want to read... Ezekiel 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45... Uh, 46, 47, 48, where does Ezekiel end? 48, uh, and then you run into Daniel after 48. If you want to read all that on your own time, um, he, he does, he measures everything in this temple. I mean, he, he measures every single thing. Some say that this is the measurements of the temple uh, that is going to be built in Jerusalem. That's what some say. Uh, I'm not convinced. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I'm not convinced. Okay? Um, I, it's one of those things where we have it written down for us, but because we can't see it literally with our eyes, we can't really imagine it correctly and everybody in this room even after you read it everybody if, if I were to ask you to draw this out as best as you can uh, or hire if you were to have five or six different guys that were architects and they were to take these measurements and draw out this temple you'd probably get six different temples okay so uh, it to, to me it's still I don't know just something that I'm just I don't know I don't know what it is, okay? I don't know what the connection is uh, with Revelation 2, by the way. So anyway, let's go back to Revelation. There was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel, we don't know the measurement of this reed. Uh, but anyway, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. Now, here's what we see here. We see a clear division between God's people Israel, and, I, and I, by that I mean the, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, Isaac, the seed of Jacob, their offspring through the 12 tribes, um, they are given the inner part of this temple, but the court that is outside of that uh, is given to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are going to trample it down and tread it underfoot for 40 and 2 months, which works out to how many in years? Three and a half years. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And here you have a Savior who came to this world when he was baptized at 30, and he died three and a half years later. Okay? 
Symbolism means everything. Numbers are important. And I did, I did a little study on this, on this, uh, this particular time frame. And uh, then I'm going to, if I get to it, I'm going to throw something at you. If not, I'll wait till next Sunday, then I'll throw it at you. But then he says, verse 3, I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score days. That also is 42 months or three and a half years. Same amount of time. Clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and two candlesticks. Uh, we, I have notes on that and uh, we'll get to that shortly. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now I have you here at the bottom here the word witnesses. In your King James. 49 times, 7 times 7, okay? So, let's do, let's do some more pretending, okay? Let's take, uh, let's, let's just assume that the traditional uh, form or the tra traditional version of this passage of Scripture is that there are going to be two men that God is going to send to this earth and for three and a half years, they're going to preach. They're going to preach and they're going to continue to preach. And the world is going to get fed up with them. We're going to find out as we go through this, these guys have some power. But we're also going to find out that God allows the beast that comes up out of the pit to kill them. God allows that. Um, so we're going to look into all of these things, but let's, let's make an, another application of these two witnesses. And as we read this text, let's ask ourselves: what does that fit in with this application? And what I mean by that is very simple. It is these two witnesses right here, Old Testament. New Testament. They are both the witnesses of God's words. They are the complete form of God's words. They are true witnesses in the sense that they are never wrong. They will only, they only tell the truth. They cannot lie and they will not lie. Amen? And they will never be wrong, will they? Never. They'll never be wrong. Uh, I know the bell rang, but I, since I brought that up, i got to throw this in. I, I saw a video yesterday of, of one of these, um, I don't know, New Apostolic Reformation type people where they're prophesying all the time this and they prophesy that and they have dreams and visions and they tell the future. Very seldom do they ever bring in the Bible. But this guy, I've never heard of him before, but he had, he had somebody, and it's verified that this video was made four months ago. <clears throat> this guy prophesied, he said he saw a vision where uh, Trump was at a rally, and he said uh, there was a bullet, there was an assassination attempt, and a bullet came right by his right ear. Now stop right there. Wow. And it, like I say, it's verified this was four months ago. And he said, and he said what happened was it, it was so powerful that it caused him, it exploded his eardrum and it caused him to lose his hearing in that ear. And he said, when it went by him, he immediately got down on his knees and asked Jesus to save him. And he was saved right there uh, on that, at, that, at, at that time. He was saved right then and right there. Okay? Now, I think there's something else that he put in there too. Now, what do you think about that? Could this guy be a prophet? Why can't he be? That's exactly right. We don't, we don't have any information at all about Trump 
asking Jesus into his heart the day that that happened. And number two, didn't bother his eardrum at all. He still hears. Okay? So he got one thing right and at least two other things wrong. And the test of a prophet, if you want to write this down and read it, Deuteronomy 18, toward the end of the chapter, if you want to look at it, the test of a prophet is he cannot be wrong one time. If he's wrong one time, God said, you don't have to listen to him. But people, it's like they don't care anymore what God really says. They're willing to take something like that. And now you're going to have all these people believing that Donald Trump is a born-again, Bible-believing, walking-talking, King James-preaching Christian. Okay? It, it would be nice. Yeah, it would be nice if he was. But it didn't happen. And that guy told a lie. And this one never does. Never does. Father, thank you for your word. This is what we rely on. The words of men are meaningless to us. It is the word of God that matters the most. We pray, dear God, that you would bless this word. Bless it in our lives. Bless it in our families, our friends, our churches, our country. And Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. And Father, as, as we read this morning in your word, for your namesake, deliver us, Father, from our own sins. Deliver us from the paths of wickedness. Set us on the path of righteousness, Father, for your namesake and for your kingdom's sake. That's what we ask this for. We ask this in Jesus' name and amen. Amen.